Welcome back to Mentor Nation, the podcast for entrepreneurs looking for real mentorship, real strategies, and real stories so that you can go out and build your dreams. I'm your host, John Abbas, and it's time for another episode, so buckle your seatbelt and let's go. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to the Mentor Nation podcast. It is your host, John Abbas here, and I am really excited for today's interview. But before I bring on our special guest, I just want to remind all of you that if you have not been by MentorNationPodcast.com and subscribe to our newsletter, you really need to go do that really quick. When you subscribe, you get all of my most valuable content, updates when I release a new episode or a blog, but most importantly, you will be the first to know when I launch a new private Facebook group called the Mentor Nation Private Mentorship Group. I decided to do this recently because I have just so much value and just from the guests and from the things that we put together and the research that I really want to share it with you and I've been looking for the perfect place to do that. And so I decided to create a Facebook group. And the cool thing is, is in this group, I will be really focused on adding value to you guys through accountability, special guest speakers, Q&A, and, and just really so much more. And you just won't believe what I have in store for you. Okay, now for today's guest. Uh, wow. Today I have the incredible opportunity to interview Erica Rich. This interview is different than any interview that I've ever done. Erica and my fiance, Kat, were on the same real estate team here in Nashville. And I remember first hearing about Erica when Kat came home one day and she just showed me Erica's Instagram and all of the delicious, healthy, vegan meals that she would cook and how she's only 25 years old and she's so health conscious and active. And, you know, it's crazy because Kat even wanted to start doing yoga because of Erica. And so fast forward just a little bit. You can't imagine our shock when Kat came home one day and she was crying and I asked her, I was like, you know, what's, what's going on? What's wrong? And she said that Erica went to the doctor after having some weird symptoms and they told her that she has stage four breast cancer and they gave her two years to live. Now guys, Erica is 25 years old when she got this diagnosis and I can't imagine hearing that news. But since that day, me and Kat became very involved in her journey of recovery. And after following Erica's journey for almost a year, I became so fascinated with how positive she was, how vibrant, and despite this incredible struggle, just how she remained so put together. I humbly asked her to be a guest today and share her story, her journey, and her wisdom with all of you. And guys, look, I think the lesson today is far more valuable than any financial strategy or business tip that you could ever get because, look, when it boils down to it, none of that really matters when you are facing the end of your life. I want to mention two quick things before I bring Erica on. Number one, this is not designed to be a depressing interview, but rather an inspirational one where my hope is that when you finish this, You'll be more inspired to give back, tell someone you love them, or just reflect on your own priorities and make some necessary changes. Number two, you'll hear Erica mention the name Erin Kruger often in this episode, and I want to give you clarity on who that is. She is the broker of the real estate team that Erica was on, which also Erin happened to be one of our first guests on the podcast, which ironically, happened to be one of the most popular episodes to date. So with that being said, guys, please help me welcome Erica to the podcast. Erica, thank you so much for being on the Mentor Nation podcast. I've been looking forward to this interview for a really, really long time. And so I just want to thank you for being on. Of course. Thanks for having me. I uh, am new to podcasting. This is my only my second one. <laughs> really? Mm -hmm. I'll have to make some introductions after we're done. And so, well, one of the biggest things that I'm really excited about, and like I told you before we started recording, I'm, I'm kind of nervous. 
This is like something that I've been looking forward to. And this is very different than any episode that I've ever done in podcasting. And so I want to give the audience a little bit of backstory. So Erica, we have a little bit of a personal relationship. So my fiance is on a real estate team and Erica was on that same real estate team. And are you 25 or 26 now? I'll actually be 27 in like nine days. Ah, happy birthday. So you're almost 27 years old and you know, you are living in Nashville and you guys were just absolutely crushing it in real estate. I was following you guys and we got to hang out several times. And then I'll never forget the day that, you know, Kat came home crying, right? She was just like bawling her eyes out. I was like, dude, I was like, what's wrong with you? And she like talked about you, you know, going to the doctor or like, I want you to explain the story, but you know, bottom line, found out you had stage four cancer literally out of nowhere. And it was just like, I just remember like being up that night and I was just like, oh my God, like I just put myself in your shoes for a minute. I'm like, could you imagine just like running marathons and doing your thing? And then one day you have like a headache or something and then you go to the doctor and they tell you like news like that. And so, you know, I want to get into that and I want to ask you a lot of questions that I think a lot of people would want to know if they were faced with similar circumstances. But thank you for being on and I want to just have you take a little bit of time and if you could just share a little bit about your your story, right? Like your your background, where did you grow up? What kind of lifestyle did you live? What did you do? And and how did that lead to you moving in Nashville? getting into real estate, and then just share how that led to the day that you went to the doctor and your whole world changed. So Yeah. So I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, currently living there now with my parents back home in my uh, child bedroom. But (laughs) I grew up with a very blended family. My parents are happily divorced. My mom is now remarried. And I've got stepbrothers. There's three of us that live together. And then I've got an older brother and older sister. But yeah, after I was in Pittsburgh, we didn't really live a healthy lifestyle when I was growing up. I was the first person to really go to college out of my siblings. And I went to Wittenberg University in Springfield, Ohio. And my siblings all followed me there. Delta Gamma as well, played soccer there. And then after I graduated, I really wanted to get into real estate. And that's kind of how I found my way to Tennessee to begin with. I was originally in Clarksville, Tennessee, but after being there for a few months, I realized it was not the place for a 21-year-old fresh out of college. <laughs> no. Military town? Military Not town. at all. Mm-hmm. I would make a friend that'd be gone in like a week. <laughs> <laughs> so luckily, I had some friends in Nashville, and I got a good feel of what that lifestyle was like and found a new real estate team up there and made the transition. And I kind of got to see that real estate really wasn't what I thought it was. So I um, had some fun jobs for a little while and then got back into the corporate world. And at that same time, I also found out that I had celiac disease. And that's kind of when my like health journey started because I was eating like McDonald's on the regular. And then I was like, okay, I'm allergic to that stuff. Can't eat it anymore. What Um, is celiac disease? Do you mind just explaining like, what is that exactly? So that just means I'm allergic to gluten. So anytime like bread or anything, it's like an autoimmune trigger. So I really can't eat it now because I need as much help as I can get, which is very sad. Sometimes you just want a donut and a piece of pizza. Don't they have gluten-free donuts? <laughs> Dude, it is not the same. I know. It's really like not the same. The, the minute the somebody same. can make it the same, like really the same. Billionaire. Oh, yeah. Like me, it's protein bars. It's like, dude, why do they all taste like shit? And then I'll, like, I was listening to this one podcast where this guy created – I think it was Cliff Bar, right? And he's just like, oh, yeah. I'm so tired of protein bars being like terrible. And so I was like, finally, I go and I get a Cliff Bar. And I'm like, man, this still tastes like shit. I'm like, no, this is. And there's gluten in those, I'm pretty sure. Exactly, it. exactly. So you bounce around a little bit. You had some jobs you were eating. Now, were you healthy or were you actually eating McDonald's all the time? Because I remember reading that you're, you've always been semi-healthy or is it that you've always been really active, but mm-hmm. when it comes to healthy eating, that happened after celiacs. Is that right? Yeah. So that's how you, like, it depends on how you define healthy. Like I've always been active. I've always played sports my entire life. So I've always looked fit, but I could just eat whatever I wanted. And it wasn't until I had to start restricting that and looking at food labels that I started really just becoming hyper aware of everything that was in our food. And then I actually had a friend who transitioned into a vegan lifestyle and I was like, oh, this just seems so much easier. And so I became one of those like 
preachers of like, you need to be vegan, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was working at a corporate job at the time and they just wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. <laughs> I mean, that's everybody in the early twenties, right? Like, I don't know really hardly anyone that I know a lot of young people that work out like crazy and play sports, but I know very few people in the early twenties that eat really well. That usually happens later on. So it's, mm-hmm. it's nothing out of, out of norm really. So, but I like really took it on as like, I just learned about all these foods that were in or the things that were just in our foods that caused cancer. And it just made me kind of be like hyper aware of all the foods that could cause cancer. So I made that transition into vegan at the same time, I kind of discovered yoga and really dove into it. And then I ended up quitting that corporate job and getting my 200 hour teacher training and working at Lululemon and was really making this transition into like, a like actual healthy lifestyle, what you would consider and paying attention to my food and what I was doing and just surrounding myself with that kind of community. And, and you're uh, in your early 20s still at this time. Yeah, you're I was still young. I was, you're super young. Still, oh gosh, how old was I? Like 22 or 23? Oh, okay. Perfect. Then I kind of just really started my meal prepping business at the time and traveled for a while. And that was probably tw- the year I turned 24. And then I got bored with that and kind of missed real estate and saw that Erin Kruger was hiring. And thankfully, she ended up taking me. I did all the interviewing with Erin and she ended up hiring me. And it really changed the course of everything for me because I was trying to maintain this healthy lifestyle, still doing the yoga, still cooking for people. And then I was also working for Erin. But I was probably only with her for, gosh, it was not very long. I had just gotten my real estate license back in like September of 2018. And then we transitioned to Compass December of 2018. And I got my full diagnosis February of 2019. So I was even with her for a full year before I had gotten my diagnosis. Wow. Very recent. So I went sailing for a little while and it was when I came back. It's kind of when I first started noticing like symptoms that I didn't realize were like symptoms for things. Like what? Tell me a little bit about like, what did you notice? The first thing I noticed was just like nipple discharge, which was like super small and like nothing I ever would have thought to be like breast cancer. That was probably April, May. Okay. So you go in, you get examined and like, how do they do it? And I'm really curious because cancer's everywhere, right? I think, I don't think there's anybody that's going to listen to this that doesn't have a family, a friend, a loved one, or even themselves that like, it's just, it's everywhere. So you go in and they, they prep you. Like, how do they do, does the doctor just come into the room and like have this weird look on his face? And he's just like, Eric, I have bad, like what happened exactly? So when I first went in, he just kind of did a breast exam. He's like, we're going to have to do a biopsy. So I had to get that done. And at the time I really hadn't told anyone. I um, remember whenever I went in, they did the biopsy. I don't even think my mom knew I was at that doctor's appointment. And so he came in and took the sample and like set it all up like that first appointment. And afterwards, after he like did everything, I was like, well, if it's not breast cancer, what else could it be? He was just kind of like, I think he maybe told me it could be like benign or something. And I was like, okay. And I'll never forget. I had moved into an apartment by myself and I hadn't cried. And I remember opening my apartment door and just closing it and just falling to the floor and just like weeping. And uh, I called my mom quickly afterwards and I couldn't even like talk. Like I couldn't even like get words out to be like, to tell her about it. And I told her finally, I was like, I just went to the doctor's office and I just want to let you know what they like told me. She just, I just remember her going silent on the phone and uh, she was like, okay, well, do I need to come to Nashville? And I was like, no, no, like I'll be fine. Like everything will be okay. I was like, but my um, doctor gave me his phone number if you want to call and ask. And of course, like any mom would, she immediately called the doctor and he said that I would probably feel more comfortable if I had family here. So my sister literally got on a flight the next day and was in Nashville and was at my next appointment with me. And that was when they gave me the news that it was, in fact, breast cancer. And they said it was stage four at that. Not at that time. Not at that time. Mm -mm. I still had to do, because whenever you find out it's stage four, it means that it moves somewhere else. So they took... Then they had to get a biopsy done of my liver and also my lymph node. And when those results came back, it was the end of February. And that's when they told me it was stage four. And so I still had to do all of my scans, like the heart things, like all those tests I had to do while I was in Nashville. And 
God bless Erin Kruger because she came to a lot of my doctor's appointments with me and helped my parents and I kind of like right. talk and walk through that. And I was kind of like my mom here in Nashville while I was like going through all of this. And I'll never forget, I called her and we had a meeting that day and I was like, Erin, I can't come to our, well, I first told her about the news and I was like, but I can't come to our meeting on Thursday because I'm getting evicted from my apartment. So if you don't mind telling the girls, and she was like, what? So I had just told her I'd gotten breast cancer and also that I had this going on. And it was so much going on in my life at that time. And I remember going, I ended up making it to that appointment because I went to court and got everything taken care of. But it was really at that meeting that I realized like how genuine of a person Aaron Kruger is. Right. She just told a story about Kat and how she thought that someone had like killed her in a house. And I just saw like the raw emotion of, how much Aaron genuinely cared for these women. And it just, and then everything that I had going on and it just like changed everything for me. Wow. So now you get the stage for it. And this is where I want to dig a little bit because it's like, I can only imagine, right? They're like the range of emotions. Like <laughs> I feel like me personally, I wouldn't tell a lot of people because just, you know, having a lot of pride, I wouldn't want anyone to feel sorry for me, but I can't on the other end of it, just imagine, like, I feel like I'd be like angry in the morning, sad in the afternoon. And then like, I, I just, I don't know, like what, like what range of emotions, like when you realize this, like what, what kind of thoughts started going through your mind, like yeah. after this happened that day and the next day? That day I was just, my um, sister and my friend at the time, I, right after I got my appointment, we went and got my favorite breakfast. And that's when I kind of started calling my like really close friends and like sure. letting them know. And I literally just remember sitting at the table being like, what are these people around me thinking that are hearing like this conversation going on? Because I'm just like this weeping girl, young, talking about how I got breast cancer, like telling these people, like, I really wish I could talk to those people and just like, what were you thinking? But right. I initially wasn't going to tell anyone, but I had built such a community in Nashville with yoga and all the things. And I was just so young and it was so scary. And I decided, and I had just gotten baptized and I just wanted to just like share all of those things. And I just could not believe it. And they told me I had two years to live. So it's like, how am I not going to tell like anyone that like, I might not be here for the longest time. So I did decide to share my story and I'm grateful I did, but there are definitely times where I kind of struggled with that. Right. And it's kind of a problem in the breast cancer world. Like people are ashamed of it. And we talked about that on that Zoom call that I had mentioned with my like breast cancer community that people hold it in. And I'm so grateful I didn't because I was dealing with so much like depression and stuff at the time as well. And had I done it, like, I don't know if I would be here today. And my community has lifted me up so, so much. Like I'm that's, so grateful I decided to share. That's awesome. Now, when you obviously got the diagnosis and they tell you two years to live, which sometimes a part of me, it just gets angry that doctors do that because I feel like they're putting a, a stupid limit on, like it kills your mindset. But exactly. was your mindset like initially like making preparations to fight this and win or making preparations to make peace with everything in case he's right? Like what, like what direction did you go mentally? I definitely went with oh crap, I only have two years to live. And you can kind of see that with like what I've been doing these like yeah. past 18 months because I started traveling more and I really started like living my life. And I can credit that a lot to Aaron. After I was diagnosed, I flew to California and Aaron launched a GoFundMe for me. And I raised such a generous amount of money that I was able to do all this traveling while I was dealing with my cancer and because of that, it didn't hold me back. And I'm so grateful that I did those things because it really filled up my cup. And right. not a lot of people have that privilege to do those things. And because of that, I made cancer fun. And that's really what my foundation is about. And I'm just so grateful that I was able to do all those things. Yeah, you know, it's, and I'm torn as well, because I feel like one of the things that really could make cancer worse is stress. And I feel like a lot of people when they get cancer, they just, it stressed themselves out even more. And you, you went the opposite direction. You started living your life. But I, I bet you got a lot of shit for that from people, whether they told you or didn't tell you. Yeah. I bet you got a lot of shit for doing that. I bet a lot of people, family, parents, and I can only imagine, <laughs> but were just like, you're stupid. You shouldn't be doing this. Like you need to be taking care of your health. Oh. You know, just talk a little bit about that. Like, is that what you experienced? 
I definitely do wonder like how many people are like, what the heck is Erica doing right now? But I mean, I was going through cancer treatment and you're supposed to like, I had a lady tell me she literally did not leave her house. And every time her husband came in, he had to like shower before he was allowed to see her kind of like how people are with like COVID. Right. Like that's how they act. Like we're treating their life during this hardcore chemo they were doing. And meanwhile, I'm like traveling on airplanes back and forth to Nashville. I went to New York. I was in California. Like I was doing all these things. And my parents definitely were like, I know they were like, wish that I would just stay in Pittsburgh and like be sick. Like everyone was expecting me to like be ill, but I felt so great. Like I had like right. some chemo side effects, but I did not feel feel nearly as terrible as everyone had prepped me for. And so because I didn't, and I had all these like resources, I was like, well, I'm going to travel. I'm going to go see my friends that I haven't seen in so long because I haven't had the time or the money to do so. And so I just started going to my friends and I would like literally get chemo. And then the next day drive to New York. (laughs) That's wow. So Eric, I have one other question, and this is something, you know, a lot of the listeners that are listening may have a better understanding, but I want you to talk a little bit about like just the experience of chemo. And I know there's a lot of different types of chemo, but, you know, and you've done several different types, I'm assuming, correct? Yeah, I've, I'm like, honestly, on my last like strand of medicine that they have like available for people with my type of cancer. Jeez. So, can you take us, like, just walk us through, like, what's that like? You know, do they make it comfortable or fun? Or is it like this? Because I can imagine it like you go in and you sit down in this cold chair and you're in this, like, empty hall and they're like, Miss Erica Rich, we'll see you now. And they take you in. Like, can you share how it really is? What's it like? Well, luckily they do have heated chairs, which is like, <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, this was something that I was super scared about at first because Doug, Aaron's husband, had gone through his own battle with cancer. And the way that he told me about his chemo was terrifying to me. Like, I was so scared. I thought I was going to be in the hospital, like bedridden. And it ended up being nothing like that. I go into my cancer center, I check in, and I felt like my little thing. And then sometimes you meet with the doctor, sometimes you don't. But they basically just take you back to a room and they hook you up and they just like feed you drugs through an IV. Through an IV. Okay. Okay. But there are so many different types of chemo that people get. This is just a specific kind that I get. And it's always been through an IV. I have, I've done radiation as well, which is the laser beams I've had to do all over to my head and then just certain spots. But I took really well to my medicine. I was expecting at first to be like, bedridden and really sick and not being able to do anything. And that was not the case at all. So like all the horror stories I had heard from people, I was just like, my family and I were literally just like waiting around. They were like staring at me, like waiting for all the bad stuff to happen. And it kind of just like never happened. So you go and you get the treatment IV, like you don't, you didn't feel like super icky, like right after not wanting to eat. My first round when I did like my six initial rounds of like hardcore chemo. I yep. did have more side effects. Like I really only craved like popsicles. I had very mild like mouth sores and stuff, but I was expecting to be like bedridden, like yeah. up all the time, like things like that. But I was well enough that I could still travel and do all the crazy things I did. And honestly, the worst side effects I've had has just been dealing with my stomach and trying to get that to cooperate. But it's right no worse than like what people are dealing with on a normal basis. Like it's crazy. I'll talk about my chemo side effects and they're like, Oh yeah, I've like have the same problems. And I'm like, what are you doing to yourself? Eating too much spaghetti, meat sauce. Yeah. Or, yeah. That's, that's so interesting. I was always curious, like you, you know, until you experience something, you just, you have this idea of what something would be like, right? Like, and a lot of times, your mind makes you believe whether it's through movies or just through your interpretation that it's like so much scarier Mm -hmm. than, and I'm sure maybe it is for, for some people just depending on their body, their age and how they are. But I just wanted to get kind of your experience, what that process was like. Like, do you have somebody to kind of talk to, or is it like, you know, going in and just getting a normal checkup, right? Like you just go in, you check in, they have a heated chair, thank God. (laughs) And they call you in, hook you up. And then is that it? You just, they, remove the IV and then they're like, all right, well, we'll see you next week for, it's oh, like, that's, okay. It's interesting. Cause they have like a room and there's just like, a, like maybe six women max that are getting like chemo through their IV bags. Sometimes you get a room with a window. Sometimes you don't. 
I really feel like they need to just have like chemo stations in Hawaii that they ship you out to to get these things so you have a nice view because it would be much more enjoyable. But yeah, you just kind of come in, get your port hooked up, and then depending on like what round you're on is how long like the medicine takes. And then sometimes it can take like an hour, sometimes it can take four hours, and then they send you home. <laughs> gotcha. Now, I mean, obviously, I can imagine your conversations are different, right? More vulnerable. Because like, you know, I imagine, obviously, you know, a lot of most people, I'd say a lot of the conversations they have on a day to day are just surface conversations, right? Like, hey, how's it going? What's up? How's the kids? How's the family? But you know, you can imagine when something like this happens, it's like, they're more meaningful, right? Is, is, is that what you experience? Like, were they just better experiences? Yes, and no, because like when I first got diagnosed, like I put on this big happy smile, but like I did not want to go back to Pittsburgh. And my family, like the way that I ended up going to Pittsburgh was because I had a scan done and it showed that I had like a fracture in my right hip and the doctor in Nashville wanted to do surgery. And luckily everyone was on uh, spring break. And I was like, well, I'm not going to take like your like fifth lineup doctor because everyone's gone. And so... I actually flew back to Pittsburgh that night and had a second opinion with my current oncologist here in Pittsburgh and basically got stuck in Pittsburgh and had to start chemo treatment here, which was one of the probably best things that ever happened. That's really good. Okay. So this was, you know, we're talking almost a year ago or even more. Like, can you update everybody that's listening right now? Like, where are you at right now? Because you were diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. What What's going on right now? Like, you've had a lot of tests and therapy like can you just update like what's the status currently yeah, so one of my biggest cancer fears did come true december i had to do 10 rounds of brain radiation which was so crazy that's kind of when cancer got a little bit scary and then i crushed that saw you at the christmas party my last that's <laughs> right after that's my right. last day of radiation still had my hair and then my cancer had also come back to my right breast as well so i was doing chemo for a little while and then covid happened so i had to take I missed like a month of treatment because I had some things going on in my lungs and I wasn't sure if it was COVID. My scans were so blurry that they weren't sure if it was pneumonia, it could be cancer. And then I got a CT scan and it showed that it was probably cancer. And then the next day I woke up and I just walked from my bed to the bathroom and I was like, I could not catch my breath. And my mom was like, ambulance. And I was like, you're overreacting. And she was like, ambulance. So the ambulance came and, uh, I'm so grateful she did because they gave me a breathing treatment. I was like, oh, thank goodness. And I spent like five days in the hospital and they did a bronchoscopy, which is the, one of the worst tests I've ever had to do. I'm like choking on phlegm and they're like shoving things down my throat. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. And then those results came back that the cancer did spread to my lungs. Earlier in March, I found out that the cancer also spread to my skin, but the skin of my right breast. And But because of COVID and what was going on in my lungs, surgeries were canceled, plus I couldn't handle right. it. So my doctor put me on more of an intense chemo than I'm on now. And I did three rounds of that this month of June. And then they gave me a month off for just my gene targeted therapy. And because I'm stage four, I'll have to do at least that for like the rest of my life, they say. And then next week I meet with my oncologist and I'm going to try and convince him to give me a medicine that's not as intense so I won't lose my hair. Just sure. because I'm feeling so much better. But I was on like consistent 24 seven oxygen where I was having to like walk around the house. We couldn't turn the gas on unless like the oxygen's off. I want to interject for a second. Like you look great right now, but I mean, we're like, for those listening, we're talking a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Like just a couple of weeks ago, you were on oxygen. I mean, you look so different two <laughs> weeks ago than you do now. Yeah. Like it's, it's mind blowing, mind blowing. I, it blows my mind. And really the only thing that you like can tell that I have been sick for a few months is I'm so skinny right now. I got down to like 113 and I started cancer at like 155. So I'm trying to pack on the pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eating than, whatever, eating butter. <laughs> everyone's like, go to McDonald's, eat a Big Mac. And I was like, you don't know me. And that's really just <laughs> Yes. So I've been eating so much food and it's been really fun. That's good. Um, now, are you, I mean, obviously, you know, the diagnosis is still like from them, from the doctors anyway, still like you still have stage four. Like, are they still giving you the same timelines right now? Like you um, only have this long to live. Like, are they more hopeful now? Like, cause you're responding to treatment. Like what's the latest? Yeah. And I, I've been responding really well to my treatments when I'm on the right one. So that's been very nice. But 
the two year thing is just kind of like a benchmark for like just metastatic breast cancer patients. I think my doctor is just very surprised. I think I surprised him the most out of all of his like cancer patients that I'm doing so well, considering just my diagnosis and how many places the cancer has been. But I don't know, like I tell myself that it's going to go away, even sure. though it's like a forever thing. But then like I do these Zoom calls and people are like, oh, you need to talk to my friend. Like she has been like six years and it's like, oh, wow, that's still like really short, like six years. Absolutely. Like, it's a time. I believe that. And I want to tell a quick story because this is something that happened to me. And I really believe that that what you tell yourself, there's a book that I recommend everybody reads that's listening to this. And it's called What to Say When You Talk to Yourself by Shad Helmstetter. One of the best books I've ever read. And mind over matter, the, you know, it's just like a saying to a lot of people, but it's true. So when I was in the military, I had this mental block and and my goal for probably six months was to bench press 225 pounds, which was two plates, two plates on each side. And it was like, no matter what I did, how hard I worked out, I, I just could not bench press 225. And I, I mean, we're talking six months of trying and I just, I couldn't push it all the way out without support. And I could get 205, I could get 215. It was just 225 was like this barrier. And so I remember one day I was warming up, my buddy came and he was spotting me. And so I was going to do a warm up with 215 and then I was going to try to get 225. And I went, I laid down, he put 215 on there and I pressed it up. It was really no problem. And I was like, all right, man, let's do 225. And he's like, that was 225. And I was like, what? And he's like, cause he put like little weights on there. And I, I didn't yeah. realize that he actually had put 225 on there and I pushed it up. No problem. And I just, there was a really important lesson that I learned at that time. And it was just like, man, you know, it's, it's really all in your mind to an extent, right? Like, I mean, I'm not going to put 495 on there and be like, come on, John, you got this, bro. Like, let's go. But you know, it's just, it's crazy how powerful the mind is when it comes to everything. I want to switch gears a little bit because this is where I really want to have you share your wisdom with the audience. Because I mean, you know, as well as all of us, the, the one thing that we all have in common is we, we all are going to die. Like we all, we don't know when, we don't know how, we don't, I, none of us know any of that, but you have an insight based on doctors telling you things that you can share something that I think could really help everybody. And so I just want to dive into that a little bit. So throughout all of this, like what's your biggest fear? Like what are you the most afraid of right now? Yeah, whenever like I first started thinking about this, I was like, I don't really know what I'm scared of. I'm not really afraid of like death anymore. I've kind of figured that out, but. So you're um, not, you're not afraid of, of death. How did you make peace with that? Like, I just want to know how you did that. It's actually pretty crazy. The day that I found out that my breast cancer returned in October of 2018, or no, 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 that would have been 2019, like right before my brain radiation and stuff. My dad got hit by a car the exact same day. And I wasn't going to tell anyone about my breast cancer until like I got my biopsy results back. But again, the doctor was kind of like, if it's not breast cancer, what is it? Like it's breast cancer kind of thing. And then my dad got hit by a car and I was like, oh my God, like it's like you can have cancer or like literally you could just be walking and someone could just hit you with their car. You have no idea. And I think at that point, that's when it kind of like really switched for me that like everyone, like you said, like anyone could die at any moment. That's right. And there was this woman who I'm still really good friends with, but she kind of, with these level of fear shirts, it's kind of where it came from. And she was just like, send me an email of everything you're feeling right now. Cause I was just really down in the dumps, really dealing with like survivor's guilt because I had just crushed chemo and I'm like, okay, now what? she was like, this next chapter of your life is going to be about choosing love over fear. And so, you know, with taking that on, like, what are you going to do with that? And I was like, you're so right. Like, I can't live out of the fear that I'm going to like die in two years. And I'd be lying if I said that this Easter was, you know, different because of COVID. Sure. And everyone was out on the back porch and I was terrified to go out because no one was social distancing really. And I was like, this is going to be my like last Easter. Like, why isn't my family accommodating? Or this potentially could be my last Easter. Like, why isn't my family accommodating more to like, making sure I could be out there. And right. I was just sitting in my room crying about it. And I was like, and it was all just because I was scared of getting COVID. And I let that hold me back from like spending Easter with my family. And it's like, okay, well, you could get hit by a car. You could get COVID. Like, like really, what is there to be scared of? Like, that's if right. you don't do it, you don't even know. I think that took a lot of it away. Just Abs like, that's so awesome. Then that's very helpful. Like, are you ever angry? Like, like, why me? Like, you know, 
Yeah. Do you ever just tell yourself like, man, I'm, I'm in my twenties, I'm healthy. I've done all the right things. I ate all the right things. Like mm-hmm. how the fuck could something like this happen to me? I don't have a history of cancer in my family. Like, did you ever think that? Or do you still think that? Yeah. Well, at first, like when I first got diagnosed, I remember taking a bath and just being like kind of relieved. I was like, Oh my gosh, like I knew something was going on. Like, I know I'm going to get the help I need. Like, I kind of just like felt like relief from it. And then like recently I had, I made the decision to retire my real estate license and it was really, really hard because I've always had like three jobs and like sure. my job was my identity. And it's just like, I could be in Nashville right now with one of the like most badass real estate teams, just crushing it. And here I am at home living at my parents' house and I'll have moments where like, I'll let that like make me mad because I want to be doing something else. But then I've been able to do so much with my foundation since then. It's like, okay, this is all happening for a reason and I'm not in charge. But then all of a sudden I'll get news that cancer spreads my brain. And I'm like, seriously, I didn't even have a, like a headache and there's cancer in my brain. Like what, what, like what, like, and then I'm like, I've been eating healthy. I've been doing this, but whenever I do get like new diagnosis, like it's always when I'm not in a very good mental state. So it's hard for me to be angry because I'm like, okay, well, I knew this was going to happen. I've been like really depressed and down lately and cancer moved to my lungs. Like everything was going on with COVID and it was winter here in Nash or in Pittsburgh. So I've been not feeling the best. And then now the sun is finally out and like, you can just see my mood and just like how I'm feeling has been so much more upbeat and everything's going on. So it's that's absolutely, (laughs) absolutely. Now, do you have any regrets like at all? Yes. Because one of my big fears is that I potentially won't like meet my husband and like have a family. And that really wasn't something that I ever considered for myself until getting cancer and like sure. seeing that and like really craving that. And one of my biggest regrets is that I hadn't really prioritized that like earlier in my life. Like I have, well, all of my friends really have like significant others. And I spent more time focusing on that one guy who like never, sure. I never should have talked to, but taught me so much. But also, it just never was really a priority for me. And I always told myself I didn't want to have kids. Like, I don't want to get married. My parents are divorced. So I kind of always put it to the back burner. But um, So you would want kids now? Like, if you... Yeah. If, I could, if I have kids, there will be miracles because I've technically like, have gone through, like, menopause and, like, all this stuff. So if I ever have kids, like, they are God's gift and they are supposed to be here. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, but also, like, I can adopt and stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean... Like me and Kat, we we feel the same way, right? Like whether it's our own kids or whether we adopt kids, like, you know, it's just putting who you are, your knowledge into a younger person, a younger generation and teaching. It's like, to me, it makes no difference whether it's biological or not. Like we both feel the same way. Like it really makes no difference to us because if you mold a baby into an adult, it's like everything that you are is in them anyway, whether or not they're biological, like blood is just blood who cares like that's how we look at it family is set up right now (laughs) yeah exactly so is there advice that you would give listeners just in regards to the perspective that you have now like is there a lesson that you've only learned with a brush with death Mm -hmm. that you wish everyone out there would know yeah i would say don't wait until the cancer diagnosis to start like living your life like and what do you mean by living it? Like, do you mean traveling, having great, con- or all of it? Like, do you mean, like, what, like, when you say live your life, what are you doing now that's really different? Are you just living carefree, having better conversations, traveling more? Like, when you say living your life, what does that mean to you? I would say I do a lot more of, like, what I want to do. Like, I'll think about, like, what I want to happen. Like, for my birthday, I, like, all I want to do is eat bar taco and at True Food. So I'm like, we're going to do that. So I honestly am thinking about going to Nashville because the only thing that's holding me back is this fear of potentially getting COVID. It's like, I can take steps to do that. But like, if COVID didn't happen, what would I be doing on my birthday? I would be going to Nashville to eat at those places and do what I want to do. And this morning, actually, I was like, I'm going to do it. And so I texted my friend. I was like, what are you doing on June 30th? And she was like, nothing. I was like, you want to get dinner? (laughs) I think I'm going to go if I can get like find somewhere like safe for me to stay, but like doing those kind of things. It's like people are working jobs that they completely hate. Like they're just miserable working for a paycheck. And I've really learned that like money is not everything. Like because of my GoFundMe and experiencing what that feels like, I really learned that I had been prioritizing the wrong things and I wasn't prioritizing family. Like I'm so much closer with my family now. Mm. And 
I am not like working paycheck to paycheck and like I'm not working to be making like a hundred K this year. Like I would be fine with 90 K a year now, like right. with the lifestyle I can like be happy with and do the things I can do. But before I was like, I need to be a millionaire and I need to work and do all this stuff. But like those things really aren't important because at the end of the day, Absolutely. if I die and have a bunch of money in my bank account. Absolutely. What's exactly. So Eric, if you beat this, do you think you'll live a much different life than before? Like, or what would you do differently? Like, let's yeah. say you fully recover, you beat it, you're in complete remission. What will you do differently moving forward? It's crazy to hear you say that because it's like someone who has metastatic breast cancer, like they're technically like is no remission. I really struggled with that after my first like six rounds of chemo because a doctor told me that I had no kinds of like disease in my body. And I was like, what already? Like this is unheard of. And that was not the, actually the case. And so that's when I learned that I, I'm going to be on treatment for the rest of my life. Like they're telling me every three weeks, I'm going to have to be getting this gene targeted therapy. So it's still hard for me to like accept that that potentially is my reality, but also I'm a firm believer in the mind over matter That's and right. I'm like, it's going to go away. I'm going to be in remission. I'm going to be one of those people. I'm going to be the radical remission that people are like, Whoa, this is wild. Like, how did she do this? Honestly, like I've been trying recently to like do my one, two, five year plans. And I just see this like next year being a lot about like healing and like taking like all the stress out of my life, which is why I decided to retire my real estate license because right. it was stressing me out trying to get my credits and I had been praying on it. And every time I had a class, I was either in the bathroom with diarrhea because of my chemo treatments or I had a last minute like CT scan and it just wasn't working. And I was like, okay, Erica, just like notice this, like take the stress out of your life right now. You don't need it. Like, right. and so I did that. And then i like, after that, I'm like really hoping that I am in remission and I can make my way back to Nashville and get back to doing either like traveling and teaching yoga or getting back to doing real estate and maybe two years or five years. But I just see myself getting back to doing the things that I like love. Right. And Do you think money will ever be as like as important to you as it once was? No, but I also, my relationship with money has really changed. Sure. My family was never really well off. We were always, you know, my, I have three other brothers and sisters and money was a struggle with me growing up. And my dad does real estate stuff and he was always very cheap and yep. never really shared it. And I remember one day when I was thinking about quitting my corporate job, I asked him, I was like, what his thoughts were? And I was like, why did you grow up? Like, or why, like, why are you the way you are? And he's like, well, I never wanted to grow up poor. And then I thought about my life and I was like, what? I was like, we did grow up poor. And uh, once he said that, and I was like, it's not worth it. And so I think my thoughts with money will change, but it also comes to me a lot easily. Like right. all of a sudden it'll just like pop up in the mail or like, like random things will happen and I just haven't had to worry about it. So um, because I had to worry about it, like this stress has just kind of been taken off my plate for the first time in my entire life. And that stress has like been help so helpful with my healing. Like right. God knew what he was doing whenever he brought Aaron Kruger into my life to help me with that GoFundMe. Like, man, that's, man, that's really incredible. And we're going to talk about that before we wrap up here in just a few minutes. So I want to ask you kind of a deep question, something that, I mean, obviously it's scary to think through. And I apologize ahead of time before asking you this, but it's something that, you know, there's a company out there that I really believe in. And I think there's a few companies that do this and I can't remember the name of it, but it's like legacy or something like that. It, and it's where like you can go to this company and they make a series of videos that they will give to your family in case something like happens to you, right? Like let's say you die in a car accident yeah. and randomly and you never got to tell your kids all the things that you wanted to tell them and you never, so that's what this company does, right? It's like they make you take the time and you make these videos like, and everybody does it differently, right? Like some people will like make a video for their son at age 16 and then 21 and then at their wedding day. And it's just like, and it's really powerful. I think it's such a beautiful concept, but you know, I want to ask you, you know, if you, let's say that you don't beat this, what do you want your legacy to be? Like what, what lesson do you want to leave the world with? What do you want to like, what piece of Erica do you want to share with everybody that could really help them? That's really hard to say because I feel like I'm still building that Erica now that I've like stepped right. into this like new mindset and like I used to be just like very cranky. Like 
when my family sees like people saying I'm inspiring and stuff, they're like, God, Erica used to be such a bitch. Like I used to be so <laughs> mean to my brothers and sisters and my mom. And like, even now I still pick on them because they don't like eat healthy or do healthy things. And yeah, um, I really just want my, like, I want people to remember me as just someone who had fun, like having cancer. Like I want people to start like it makes me so sad seeing like these women not wanting to like tell people and not like just like hearing that they're not even like getting out of their beds. I'm like, you have no idea how beneficial like just going out in the sun for a few minutes would like do for you. And I just want people to like really just take on the spirit (laughs) that I've had while having breast cancer and not letting that like get them down. Absolutely. I love that. You know, they say, that your mess becomes your message and your test becomes your testimonial. And so, you know, I feel like when you beat this, that you'll, I mean, it doesn't even have to be real estate, right? Like I think a lot of people, you can inspire and help a lot of people that are just experiencing what you're experiencing now. There's a need for that. There's a really big need for that because you can go there with somebody that nobody else can go there with, right? Like, you know, Uh your, your parents, They love you. They raised you, but they can't go that deep with you because it's not like they've been through it. Right. And so now that you're here and you're going through it, like, I feel like you could help a lot of people. You really could. You know, I remember, and I put it in the notes that I sent to you, Holly Butcher. I don't know if you read that letter. I loved rereading that. Oh my God. Oh man. You know, and for those listening, Holly Butcher is a young girl that she passed away at age 27 of cancer. But before she passed, she like wrote this letter of all the things that she's, just the advice she's giving people that they should be doing, the things that you think are important, aren't important. Go live your life, go do things. And this letter went viral. And I mean, I like bawled my eyes out reading it. And it's just... And to me, it's so powerful because, you know, a lot of us, a lot of people, they get 80, 90 years on earth. But if you really look back, I'd say a lot of them only lived one of them or two of them, you know, like, and so this is just a really, really, really crazy situation that, that, that you're, you get to reflect. So let me ask you, I mean, you look great. Like, how do you, how do you feel right now? Like, do you like truly, is it tired, hopeful, scared, strong, worried? Like, how do you feel? like overall right now? Right now I feel like really good, but I'd be lying if I said that I didn't find out that a like friend that I have that has cancer found out that like a tumor doubled in size in her brain, just like randomly out of nowhere that like, I'm not scared sometimes that I, after I get a scan that that's going to be the case. But sure. I think just because I'm so hopeful because I've been dealing with like outside of even cancer, like just mental health struggles for so long and not telling everyone about it. This is really the first time in my life I've like opened up about those things. And just with my talk on Zoom on Friday, realizing that I can make such a big impact just by talking about that stuff. And I finally talked to my family about that stuff. And I think that's why we're doing so well. And I never thought that I would be here two years ago before I got breast cancer. Absolutely. And that's that's another really important lesson. I mean, I think so. It's just like, you know, we all hold this stuff in, right? And yeah. we think if we talk about it, something bad's going to happen, right? Like yeah. they're going to judge me or, it, but it, almost 100% of the time, it strengthens the, like like 100%. I don't think there's ever a situation where it crushes, like it just strengthens the relationship when you just, you're vulnerable and you talk about that. It's something that I wish that I talked to my dad. My dad passed away less than two years ago. And we, you know, we always had those like pride conversations. Like we never got really, we never told each other what was really going on. You know, dad would always be like, how's it going? I'm like, oh, everything's great. But I would never tell him like really like, man, you know, cause I went through a divorce in 2013 and I kept that all in because I had this like just face to make in front of everybody, but I never told him, you know, like how bad it was and how crazy it got. And like, so it's just, it's really awesome that you said that. Erica, this has been an incredible interview. I I have to close with a couple of things. Number one, you have a nonprofit that you're really focusing on. Talk about that. Talk about, I'm going to put it all in the show notes, so don't worry, but I want you to talk about the nonprofit. What does it stand for? What are you doing? How can people support? How can people contribute? Can you just share that really quick? Yes. My nonprofit is called Bloom Foundation Gives, and my sister actually created it when she was getting her, I forget what the degree is called, but she had to do this <laughs> project and she was actually working on something and completely dropped everything to start researching metastatic breast cancer. And so that's what the foundation was about. And 
she was actually the one that really pointed out that my life was only two years long. And I was like, oh my gosh. But I, because of that, I kind of pushed it to the side. And then after brain radiation and Aaron's generous gift from Christmas, I was like, I'm going to do this. And I really just want the whole point of Bloom to be about making breast cancer fun for everyone and doing what I can to like help with that. And just like mind, body, spirit kind of thing, because sure. I'm so focused on that. Because there's so many foundations raising money for like research and this and that. I just want ours to be about having fun. Yeah, so I started that and kind of had to put it on pause while I was sick and then just recently was like, okay, well, if I can't do my 16 hours of continued education, what if I put that towards Bloom? And we were to do the shopping spree fundraiser and we actually have our next fundraiser coming up. I'm like launching it on my birthday at the end of the month. I'm super excited. But we'll be selling t-shirts again. I made these ones. So I came up with a new design. Dude, that's a great. That's a great shirt. Thanks. I was you like, made that? That's my handwriting. That's, yeah. oh, that's aw- like, wow. That's yeah, an incredible so shirt. After uh, that story I told you. Yeah. The, the slogan. And then these new ones are, yes, I cancer, but the cancer is like crossed out. Uh, uh, when I, worked I at love Lulu, that. Kind of like your email. But when I worked at Lululemon, my friend was like, I make my emails an affirmation. So I made mine, yes, I can. And I came up with that the other day because I'm on a steroid right now and I literally cannot sleep and my mind is always racing. But Dude, uh, I love that. Like you've got to go ahead and create that link. Let me have it. For, like I'll, I'll put it everywhere. That's, that's incredible. How can people follow you on social media? Are you still active at all? Like, or do you do any videos or anything that is like inspiring or people that are maybe going through something similar can follow you? I mean, maybe you don't have the energy to do it, but is how can people follow you? Yeah. So when I am in a good mood and posting things, you can follow me at Erica, E-R-I-K-A, Growing Rich at on Instagram and then Bloom and then Team Erica on Facebook to kind of keep up with the up to dates and then bloomfoundation.gives on that's our website, that's our Facebook, that's our Instagram. But awesome. We're currently looking for people to that have just recently been either diagnosed with breast cancer or who are dealing with stage four metastatic to give away our first round of cancer care bags to. And they're going to be so awesome. I'm so excited for these. They're going to just be full of so much goodness that I am just so excited to give to women. That's awesome. Well, I can't wait to promote the, the heck out of it. You know, I had one other question that I wanted to ask before we wrap up today, sure. because this is another thing that, you know, it's, it's really interesting. The last 12 months, I've had more people that I know get cancer than ever in my whole entire life. And I wanted to ask, because there's a lot of information out there and a lot of it is conflicting. And I'm sure you have had your own struggles with like, holy shit, like who's right, who's wrong. Like, I'm sure everybody's cramming their advice down your throat. Like, you need to drink this. You need to eat this. You need to do this. Have you thought about doing this? Like, is there anything that you've learned so far in your journey that has been helpful that is like the opposite of what is just all over the internet? Is there anything that like you've learned from a doctor or doing your own research in your own journey that is like contradictory or like anything that's helpful? Yeah. For one, this is why I'm so grateful that you guys are creating this app mentor because like that is what you need whenever you get like cancer. Like you need a mentor, someone that's going to be like, this is actually what happens. Because right. people scared the crap out of me when I first got diagnosed. They were like, just like, uh, so Aaron's husband, Doug, he dealt with cancer when he was younger. And like, his experience was completely different than mine, but it was so much more like intense and crazy. And so that's what I was expecting. And that's not what happened at all. <laughs> and uh, even to this day, he's like, I just can't believe Erica is like, doing cancer <laughs> like this. And I'm like, that's good. That's not your scary story. <laughs> but just like that. I like I would just benefit so much from talking to someone like me as opposed to a doctor because they're scary. But honestly, read the radical remission because it is a game changer. Like it's taught me more about like how to view cancer and what to do about it as opposed to like treatments and surgeries, which I haven't had to do yet. So I haven't like experienced that like side of things. But I just really encourage people to read that book because it kind of just like sums everything up. And it's been such a game changer for me. That's like, awesome. All of my tricks are in that book. So I'm including that in our cancer care bag. So I'm really I love happy. that. And then that'll also be in the show notes. Erica, this has been an unbelievable interview. And actually, I hope we can do it again in a couple of months. Like I feel like this was more meaningful then because a lot of my interviews are success and money and it's it's talking with someone like you that makes me really understand that that's not what's important right like those things aren't bad but what's important is 
are you spending your time doing what you feel like you're meant to do, enjoying life, you know, having great relationships, not just chasing the dollar, which not all countries are like that. America is, I think, one of the worst. It's just like everybody has this mentality that you need to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week if you're not at this certain status. And it's interviews like this that- I love that. <laughs> exactly. Same with us too. And I just, it, it really is, it's interviews like this that makes me really realize like, man, I need to slow down. I need to spend time with people that mean a lot. I need to live, you know, there's that saying, right? Live like today's your last day. And nobody fucking does it, right? Like, it, it's like one of those sayings. It's like, oh yeah, fucking cool. Let me put it on my wall <laughs> and never look at the shit. But, but really, you know, it's, it's important to do that, at least make an effort to do that. So this has been absolutely incredible. I hope to have you on again in, in, in a couple of months. And I hope in the next interview that your hair is super long and you've sold a million t-shirts and yeah, you're, you're a master yogi yourself, but, but I'm excited. I'm excited for you and we, we all support you. We pray for you. And I just want to thank you for taking time out of your day to be on here to share an important message with everybody. Yes. And happy father's day again. And Thank you so much for having me. This seriously, I've been looking forward to this, and I'm me too. Oh, still sweating. Yeah, I, me too. Me too. <laughs> I got rained on. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you, Erica. Appreciate that. All right, everyone, guys. Look, I hope that this episode resonated with you, and that you got some value out of it. And I want to ask that if you know anyone that you believe will get value. Please take one minute and share this episode. I will post the video interview on our YouTube channel where you can see Erica. Um, this was actually a video interview. So if you just saw the audio or just listened to the audio version of it, feel free to roll on over to YouTube. The link is in the show notes. You can find the show notes at the podcast or on the website for this episode and it will direct you over to the YouTube channel. Now, guys, listen, if you enjoyed this episode, I also want to ask that you please do two things for me. Number one, please visit Erica's nonprofit at bloomfoundation.gives and either donate or purchase some of her merchandise. Second, if you know anyone diagnosed with cancer, connect them with Erica or have them reach out to her. All the links will be in the show notes, guys. And you know, here's the thing. Erica is doing some incredible things with her foundation. She's doing these incredible gift bags for people with cancer. And just, I've had a firsthand look at how powerful this is and what the work that she's doing is. And finally, I just also want to ask that you help make this episode go viral because we all know, hopefully we all know, that real success is not the amount of money that you have, but rather understanding what matters and investing your time and energy into that. And I think all of us need that reminder sometimes. And this episode is a great reminder of how life is so short.